Hello all, welcome to another Research Day event. Um, we are packed with some uh, interesting content for you today. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Vishal, who will be the uh, conversation lead today. Uh, we will discuss today about the joint work of uh, uh, Reddit Engineering together with uh, an IDC master's student, uh, Daniel, who will talk about uh, uh, his work on uh, uh, optimizing uh, Kubernetes uh, service selection. And we'll also have an interesting lecture by uh, Shiv. She will talk about fine grain networking and telemetry and programmable switches. I'll hope that uh, you enjoy the content that we prepared for you today. Please uh, don't be shy. Use the chat that you have. You can also uh, ask questions after we join to the conversation and uh, uh, participate online. We also have this option. Uh, after each of the uh, lecture, you will have we will have a, a chance to ask questions, uh, have a debate, and feel free to interact. This is uh, this event is for you to learn and also uh, enrich us. So thank you very much for joining. Um, I'll uh, let uh, Vishal lead us from here. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Vishal Thapa, uh, and I'm a principal software engineer with Red Hat. Welcome to another edition of Red Hat Research Day. So we are going to start off with a presentation from Daniel. So Daniel, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you are going to talk about today? Yeah, uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Daniel. Uh, I'm a student in the IDC. And we are going to talk about the joint work uh, that uh, we did about Kubernetes uh, optimizing service selection. Uh, it's a joint work by myself and Professor Anad Ben Bar and Professor David Kai, uh, and the engineering team uh, in uh, Red Hat. Um, yeah, so I hope it will be interesting. Um, can you can every, can you see my screen? Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, so I will dive right in. Um, so everyone meet Bob. Um, Bob is the head of the, of the DevOps department in some big uh, high tech company. Um, Bob and his team maintain the company's Kubernetes clusters uh, in the east coast of the US in some cloud provider. Um, whenever there are outages or in problem with the clusters, Bob's team fixes it. And lately, uh, there are more and more outages happening for the for the company, um, whether it's because of the cloud provider's issue or because of regular maintenance that Bob is and team and his team conducted in the clusters. And uh, and I want to mention to remind you that. This cluster basically serves all the services and applications that the, that the company has. Uh, so, so it's becoming a kind of a problem. Uh, and Bob have, have heard about uh, and known about uh, multiple clusters deployment, that basically uh, you can deploy more than one clusters and, it, and enjoy different benefits that come with it. And not that uh, long after, um, Bob decides to, to deploy an additional clusters, and that's what he does. He, he casts his magic and deploy clusters in the west coast of the US. And he's, he's really, really happy with that. It basically uh, allows us to reduce it, it introduces reduce it. If there is an outage in one cluster, we can direct traffic to another clusters. And it allows us to, to have canary release and maybe testings. And, and besides that, it it uh, provides better performance for customers in, in the West Coast. Um, everyone meet Alice. Alice is the head of the R&D department in the same company uh, Bob's works. And she's basically his Bob, his, his boss. Um, every once in a while, Alice comes to Bob with, uh, with new requirements. Um, and this time, she needs him to deploy a new cluster in Japan for a, for a new customer. Um, and not only um, that uh, this cluster is, needs to be in a different geolocation, it also needs to be on-premises. It's a requirement by the customers. Uh, and Bob, as a veteran of deploying uh, multiple clusters, and again, the cast is magic. 
and deploy the cluster, uh, the new cluster in the, in the farm. Uh, Daniel, so at this point, like each cluster looks like it's a duplication of the existing cluster, right? It's more like a mirror site. The whole deployment is duplicated, right? Yeah, so so this is a great point to, to mention, uh, and it actually leads us to, to, to my next slide. Um, we, we do, we, we deploy the clusters and we kind of uh, generating duplication in, in services. And, and, and that's exactly one of the, the complaints that Alice comes to Bob and, and complain about. Um, first of all, it is not really um, uh, that feasible to eventually to go and deploy clusters per customers. We do, uh, the, the, we do uh, supply multi-tenancy um, but think about it, each uh, customer that comes and will want his own clusters. Um, I'm not sure that it's that feasible to do it. And, and in addition, it, it does uh, imply cost uh, overhead. We have duplication in services, services might be underutilized and, and, and the company suffers from it. Uh, and, and Alice comes to Bob and tell him that they pay high price for, um, for compute power. And in addition, um, she wants the ability for clusters to be able to communicate with, with each other for different services and different clusters to communicate. And it will both help them to remove underutilized services and, and save money on compute power. And, and it also allow them a very high flexibility. Um, and Bob start thinks to himself, how, how can you connect multiple clusters together? And, and he goes online and start uh, researching researching about it and then you come across submariner um, so submariner um, allows us to um, connect the net to connect directly uh, to connect networking uh, of different clusters and allows communication of pods and services uh, between Kuber different kubernetes clusters and and it's important uh, point to notice that it allows to do it uh, in a hybrid cloud environment meaning that it doesn't matter if the clusters are on premise or in different cloud providers, and we can connect them together using the submarine. It's, it's an open source uh, project led, led by Reddit, um, and and Bob is very happy with it. He he, he casts his magic again and connects the different clusters, um, and allows uh, networking uh, between them. Now, what uh, what this concept? Um, it's basically showing us this converting the multiple clusters deployment into and connecting them together um, show us, introduce us to a concept of a multi-cluster. That it basically uh, allows us uh, to look at all this cluster as a, as a cluster set or, or as a one big cluster. And then it reduces challenges. This, uh, um, this thing is, uh, uh, this technique, we can use it basically. Um, not only thanks to Submariner, also thanks to an uh, API that they uh, introduced by Kubernetes, which is the multi-cluster API that uh, allows, allows uh, the operators of the clusters to notify different clusters in the system that they have services and they're available in this IP address and you can, you can uh, connect them. But like I said, it, it introduces new challenges because we have clusters that are connected in one big and uh, and can communicate between each other, but they are in different geolocation. And and after a while, nothing is uh, so goes so easy for Bob. And and Alice comes to him with with more complaints and with more complaints. And she tells him, "Listen, Bob, since since we did the, this change, since we deployed Submariner, um, we pay a lot uh, for traffic." Um, uh, for egress traffic, the, the latency and congestion, they, they, they went up to the roof and our throughput is really poor. What, what happened? Um, Bob understand that's probably um, something with the deployment of Submariner uh, has caused this issue and, and he starts to dig into Submariner and how it works. And, and I want to walk you through the, the small research that, that Bob did and to actually take a step back uh, and, and to talk about how uh, 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 microservices-based applications are working on Kubernetes. And, and we're gonna use this, uh, this example throughout the, the presentation. Uh, it's, it's an example of, an, uh, of a simple web application taken from the, from the Istio tutorial. 
And, and what we can see here is we can see the, the full dependency uh, graph of the, of the microservices, uh, of the different microservices. And basically what happens when, when the user request arrives to the front end service, to the, to the product page, and, uh, and it needs to show uh, some product details and the product reviews, it needs to propagate requests to the other uh, service, microservices to, to gather this information. And they propagate it to others if needed. And eventually all this information uh, uh, returns to the product page and gets fulfilled. Um, so this is how, uh, how, the, uh, how microservices application are working. And it's important to remember that we are in, a, in, a, in the multi-cluster environment. So basically all these microservices might be present and might not be present in different clusters. And, and this is what I want to show you next is how this, uh, how did the, the requests are being distributed uh, within Submariner. So as long as the service is present within the cluster of, of the, the service that depend on it, the, the answer to where to distribute or where to send the request is pretty simple. We will probably choose the, the, the service within our cluster because it's the closest, it's, it's, real, it's smartest decision to make. But what happened when the service is not present within the cluster or, or it's not present because we didn't deploy there to, to conserve on, on resources or basically because, um, because the service is, is I don't know, it, it cannot uh, accept any more requests, it reaches capacity, it, it, there was some malfunction. How do we decide to, to which cluster, to which service outside of our clusters to send, to send the request? Uh, and the answer for it, it's, it's round robin. Currently, um, Submariner uses a round robin uh, load balancing technique and, and sends the different requests, distribute them equally between the different clusters. And this sh should already raise a, a red flag for us um, of understanding why, why we might pay a lot for traffic and why we might suffer uh, from, from, the, from the depredation in, in latency. Now, this, the selection itself works as follows. Uh, when we deploy Submariner in the Kubernetes clusters on Kubernetes clusters, uh, we also deploy a, 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 the Lighthouse DNS plugin. It's basically a, a plugin that, that connects to the, to the DNS in the clusters and allow us to, uh, to, to change and, and to play a little bit with the, with, the, with the service discovery mechanism in the cluster. So basically when, when product page wants to reach the, the details service, uh, it, it sends a, a DNS query. The Lighthouse plugin is aware of the different services available in, in all of our clusters. It, it, it's aware of it using the, the API I mentioned in the beginning, the Kubernetes multi-cluster API. Uh, it applies the round robin uh, load balancing, choosing an IP. In our example, it chose the IP of the service in, in cluster two. And from there, the communication is being done directly uh, with the underlying uh, VPN networking that, that Submariner uh, supplies. Um, now, how all this magic happen? How does the Lighthouse plugin is aware of all the services that are available in, in, in each cluster? Um, we can take a look at, on the on the Submariner control plane. Um, so basically, what we have here we have the, the different clusters uh, um, in our in our specific scenario, and we have one clusters that we chose the, to be the broker. Um, basically, the broker cluster um, it, it opens the API to to all the different clusters, the the multi cluster API, and it watches on changes on the different clusters. So. Whenever we deploy a service and, and export it on one cluster, it notifies the, the broker, which propagates the, the, the update to the other clusters. In this way, um, the, the, the Lighthouse plugin in all the clusters is aware of all the services and, and can make smart decisions uh, for us. So this is the uh, control plane. So it broker looks like a hub spoke. But what were the clusters themselves, the data plane between the clusters? That also goes through broker or, or clusters talk to each other directly? All right, so so yeah, the, um, basically what we have here is we have a, a full mesh, a full networking mesh. The, the clusters do not uh, really talk to each other. They do the communication through the, through the broker, but the data plane, like you mentioned, 
the communication in the data plane is being is being done directly between the different clusters. We have a full a full network mesh. That's a good point. Okay, so full mesh means data will always go to the destination cluster. It will not, you know, hop between multiple clusters. It will always be one hop away. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, and to continue, I want and and now that we we understood the the problem, we understood that the, the, there is some kind of a, of a problem on how we do, distribute the requests. Uh, I want to to again to take a step uh, backward and, and to understand the different options that we have for for solving this problem. What is what are the the, the solutions that are are totally currently being used in the industry or, or in the academic world. And, and the three main uh, load balancing technique uh, for microservices are, are as follows. We have a, an instance oriented load balancing, technique, which, which uses a central load balancer. Um, this means that we have a central load balancer sent, sit someplace, he's aware of all the service instances of all the instances of the robot and whatever we send the request it's it's being sent through the, the central load balancer which is aware of all the instances and choose the, the right instance and um, it has its, its its advantages but for our our layout which we have a distributed layout we have several uh, clusters uh, it's not really uh, pragmatic we can't really use it it will introduce a really high overhead of, of traffic um, we will have a central load balancer. We will need to decide on which cluster to put it, um, and it's re not really feasible to use. Um, another solution is a microservice-oriented load balancer, um, which is introduce a, a load balancer in front of each microservice type. So we have different instances of, of the same type deployed in different clusters, and we have one load balancer that, that directs traffic between them. Uh, but this solution is kind of suffering from, from the same uh, problems that the, the central load balancer has, because we will either have to have a, a dedicated load balancer per type in each cluster. Um, we will need to, to, to send the request. There, there will be a lot of overhead of sending the request between the different load balancers. And actually, the solution that is being adopted by the industry today is client-oriented. Uh, load balancing and it, it used pretty much in, in almost all service mesh solutions like Istio that we talked about um, and what it does it introduces um, a different component inside the client and, and when I talk about the client here I don't really talk about the, the user I'm talking more about the, the services within our system in, in each one of the service there will be an additional component, the load, the the it's called this. It's used. It's called a sidecar, um, and and this component will will decide on on the load balancing per this instance. It it will have a policy that needs to be deployed all over the all over the these components and update, and and it will make the decision. It it allows us uh, fine grain um, decision making. Um, but it does introduce uh, other other problem uh, other I don't know if problems but other issues. And um, first of all, we'll need to manage this policy and update it on over all the instances, which could we we could have hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of instances. It also introduces uh, an additional hop in the system that we will need to go through it, and and of course the resources that will that will need that will, this component will need to consume to to be able to work. Um, in recent years, there have been conducted some uh, academic work about chain-oriented load balancing. Um, these solutions are, are uh, really complex and, and, uh, and require a lot of runtime to, to solve. Uh, in addition, if you remember uh, in the previous slide, we showed the full application dependency graph. Um, and, and it takes into account the whole dependency graph and all the dependency between the different microservices and it's kind of uh, optimized all the all this service chain um, but it, like I said it has its own problems and and Bob and Alice start to think and, and brainstorm to themselves how how they can uh, what solution fits them best and understand that they they might need to come up with their own solution because the different ones has their own uh, 
own drawbacks and they do not fit their, their use case of the multi-cluster concept. And they start to brainstorm and they understand that they will need to, to optimize the, the system to, to make smart decisions and smart load balancing uh, between the different clusters. And, and Bob come to Alice and we ask her basically, what, what would you like to optimize? What, what would you like to optimize? We have different parameters. Like we mentioned before, the, the, the multi-cluster concept to introduce um, the challenges of latency and pricing and congestion and, and throughput, uh, and, and could could even introduce other other concepts like we have GDPR that we can that some clusters might not we want, don't want to access others. And you ask her what exactly is that we want to to optimize, and, and Alice tells him basically when we want to to optimize the performance, like to get the best performance for the lowest price possible, right? Um, and Bob tells her, like like we said, you are right, and, but we have a lot of a lot of parameters involved, and some of them might contradict. So, so which ones are more important for you? And now he's telling frankly, I'm not sure actually what is more important for me. Bob tells her, no problem. Listen, we define the, an abstract cost function. We, des we describe the cost function that describe a, a penalty for sending some kind of request between the source cluster and the destination cluster. Uh, in the example we are going to show in, in the presentation today, we are going to, to use two metrics, uh, pricing and latency, pegress pricing between clusters and, and latency and between the clusters. Um, and we're going to allow some trade-off and, and control trade-off between them to tell, listen, I want to put more, uh, more effort into, the, into improving the pricing or into improving the penalty. And we're going to continue with this, with this cost function that describe the penalty. Um, in addition, they understand that they are working within some system, that they have some constraint that, that, that they must comply to. And Bob asks Alice, what, what are these constraints exactly? And, and she started to, to describe it to him. First and foremost, a request cannot be dropped, right? When, when we want to, to reduce the pricing and the latency, we can just drop the request and, and, and not sending it all and not pay for it. But it doesn't really uh, suit our needs, correct? So, First, the request cannot be dropped. Um, second, each uh, service has uh, has some capacity, right? When we when we deploy uh, applications on Kubernetes on uh, services, we usually usually design them to, to hold some kind of traffic to, to have some kind of capacity, whether it's a request per second that the service can handle, or some kind of CPU utilization that it needs to meet. So each service has some kind of capacity. And that we like not to suppress, or else its performance will degrade drastically. And and last, uh, Alice tell him that she wants a constraint. She likes to call it the liveness constraint, and, and it comes from from the monitoring system that the, that they are used. They are basically uh, want to be able to send uh, some portion of traffic to to services, even though that uh, that it will not be the best service to to send traffic to. Uh, but they want to, to be able to send this traffic to know that this service is allowed uh, is alive, and basically this constraint allows uh, allows us overriding the, the the optimization decision that we're making and to to force some kind of some portion of the traffic to be sent to a specific uh, uh, service. Um, So great, Bob goes home and thinks for himself and come up to Alice and tell her, listen, Alice, I've came up with costs. Uh, Kubernetes optimized service selection, it's an optimization problem. And let me explain you how, how it plays really well within Submariner and, and Kubernetes architecture. Um, so basically, um, this optimization problem, we are going to, um, to, to distribute the, the, the concerns and and to divide the concerns between the control plane and data plane of, of Submariner. I want to, to start actually from the data plane, uh, which are the clusters. Each one of the clusters will have uh, its responsibility to, to collect the data and, and share it with, with the control plane. Um, in, for example, in our example, uh, in our scenario more or less, uh, we have the pricing and latency, so the clusters will, will check the, the latency between them. They will share this data into the control plane. And to remind you, we have we have the, the broker, which is the main component in our control plane. So, 
So most of the most of the the construction and the solution of the problem will be done in the broker. The, the clusters will share the data into it, to, to it. It will construct and, and solve the optimization problem. And, and from the solution, he will calculate weights. And, and, and these weights will be distributed back to the data plan, back to the clusters, so each one of them can make their own decision. Uh, each cluster will get a list of weights um, per, per service which would be the weights for, for each service instance in each other cluster, in, in all the different clusters. And the, and the cluster will, will apply a simple weighted round robin load balancing technique, which is fairly simple and, and efficient. And, and this is really, this is plays really nicely because um, we, we enjoy the benefits of this of distribute system. Uh, we have the data plane, the, the clusters that uh, that can work even when the control plane, if it fails or, or has some malfunction, we will still continue and distribute the the request. Like like uh, Vishal mentioned before, the the communication within the cluster with, between the cluster will be done directly. And from the other hand, we do have some uh, general point of view where we, we can look at the system as a whole and and understand the smart decision to make and, and where to. And, and where to send traffic and how to calculate these weights that, that are done in the control plane. And, and we won't need to, to share a lot of information. You know, not all the clusters, not each one of the clusters will help to collect all the data to himself and, and, and solve this solution. We do everything in the, in the control plane and kind of utilize the system uh, uh, in a smart way. Um, and, 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 to, and to conclude that, um, we're basically going to work here in, in some kind of a, of a feedback loop. Um, we are going to, the cl different classes are going to measure and collect the data. They're going to share it to the, to the control plane, to the broker, which will construct and, all, and solve the optimization problem. It will calculate the, the weights from the, from the solution and distribute them back uh, to, the, to, the, to the different clusters to make their own decisions. Uh, now I want to walk you through a, a simulation we did. Um, Just a minute yeah. before we go through with this. So I noticed that you are talking about two parameters, right? One is the latency, and the other is the cost or the price of it, right? So uh, I have two questions. First, any specific reason why these two parameters were considered? I'm sure there might be some other parameters also, right? Why these two? So yeah, that that is a great question. Um, First, we, we basically we chose this parameter for, for several reasons. Uh, first, um, this seems to be from, from the, you know, uh, asking around with it, it seems like these are the, the most crucial uh, uh, metrics for, for our customers. The late to improve the, to, to use the smartest, the, the best latency possible, to, to reduce the latency and to save up money. Um, and and some and the other reasons for using these uh, parameters are uh, they are relatively easy to measure. You know, measure ping latency between different clusters is easy, and to retrieve the the, the aggress pricing of traffic from different cloud providers, uh, it's really easy. Uh, and the last, yeah, uh, and and the last reason is because these parameters are relatively static. I mean, the ping latency from from our measuring and testing, the ping latency between different clusters are relatively steady. And of course, the, the pricing tables are, are not changing that often. And, and this is a, a, a good point that I will touch in a few more slides um, <clears throat> because it allows us um, to, to control the, the feedback loop that I showed in the previous slide and to, and to decide when to run it, right? If, the, if we would choose parameters that are being changed very rapidly, we will have to run the, the feedback loop very often to, to update and to accommodate to these changes. And that leads me to, to the second question that you ask about uh, what kind of parameters we can use. And, and basically, um, um, any kind of parameter that we can, uh, that we can describe in numbers that can, that can go into our cost functions, um, we, we can use. Um, I remember when, when we talked, you and me before the presentation, before the presentation, you 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 asked me uh, specifically about GDPR and the fact that uh, we might need to comply to, to GDPR, we might need to, to block traffic um, between different clusters, and and 
uh, and we, we actually we have in, in our model we have two options to achieve it from from one point of view if we want to use the cost function we can just you know set the cost between those two uh, clusters to infinity um, but this will will not necessarily guarantee us um, um, the traffic will not be said, sent between this cluster. It will probably minimize the communication, uh, but it will not uh, set it uh, to zero. And, and to solve this problem, we can actually use our, our, our uh, liveness constraint like to, to define that these clusters uh, cannot communicate and, and to, to use one of the constraints and to prevent from traffic to being sent there. And, um, and and more and, and other kinds of uh, parameters that can be used is whatever the user would like to quantify and, and to measure whether it's congestion or throughput um, it will just need to understand how we want to measure it and, and to put it into the to the cost function give it its own weight its own to describe the trade-off between the parameters you choose and, and it can and it can use it yeah that's a really really important point to note um, so back to our to our simulations um, we have we, we can see here that the different thing that we measured between the clusters and the, and the pricing that we pay per gigabyte of information that is that is sent out of the cluster and and i want to jump in jump right in into into our uh, into our uh, um, solution and, and and simulation the results and what we can see here in this graph which is it's quite interesting and we can see that the the trade-off between the two parameters we chose. So, like we said, we chose to use the latency and, and, the, and the pricing parameters, and and we can see that the bigger weight we give for the pricing, I mean, when beta is 0 0.99, uh, we can achieve the best uh, the best pricing possible. And when we give the latency a higher weight, we can improve the latency. And, and this is really uh, answers Alice, uh, Alice's dilemma that she didn't know uh, which, which, uh, which metrics is more important for her. And it gives the customer really high flexibility. And if we take a look at this example, for example, if I would be the operator and need to choose the, the trade-off between the, between the different metrics, I would choose better to be 0 0.4 in, in this example, as we can see. We achieve a really drastic uh, improvement in, in latency and we pay a very little price for it. Um, but again, it's super flexible and it allows each operator, if some operator tell, decides, no, I want to save even this fraction of a dollar, we have so much data being transferred, it, it will save us million. He can choose that and, and, he's, and he's willing to pay uh, in, in, in worse latency for it. He can choose it, which really allows a lot of flexibility. And, and to conclude our simulations, um, we, we basically showed that we managed to improve latency by up to 55% and, and improve the pricing by up to 25%, which, which is really impressive and nice. Uh, uh, just to clarify over here, so the way I understand it is the weights are calculated at runtime through the feedback system, but this beta trade-off is something that user can't configure, right? The, or the operator can't configure, right? Yeah, 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 true. So basically, the 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 cost function will can be determined. We, we will have our our own basic cost function. Like I said, we did the, the experiments and we designed the system with these two parameters. But it will be uh, able uh, operators will be to ex will be able to extend it uh, at their own parameters and, and describe the trade offs between the different parameters by themselves. Yeah. The, the, I mean the. Uh, so even the value of the parameter beta, like you change from 0 0.99 to 0 0.4, that's something that user is able to do, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Um, so that's it. That, that's it. Basically, Alice is is really happy and and tell Bob a good job that he did a good job and and Bob's. Uh, want to 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 express uh, his uh, an additional thing and tell and, and remind remind us that this uh, solution really integrates seamlessly within Kubernetes and, and Submarine. It does not require changes. We does not require breaking the public API, which we know we, we don't like to break, and and it's a really crucial uh, factor in, in our system. Um, before we finish, I want to go. Uh, 
through some challenges uh, and, and future challenges that we, we already faced some of them and we'll see we'll, we'll face in the future. Um, the first is age scalability. We will see more and more um, gaming application and, and 5G application and, and Kubernetes clusters being deployed in the edge, which will increase the, the number of clusters in thousands. And, and we really think that uh, there might be a problem with our, with our solution to get scale, to, to scale up to thousands of clusters. Um, and we would like to tackle it. Um, Additionally, we have the, the auto scale mechanism in Kubernetes, uh, which allows us to, to scale the uh, pods or the horizontal pod auto scale, which allows us to scale pods. And, and a lot of cloud providers also uh, provide a cluster scale where, where we can add nodes into the clusters automatically. And we think it's a really interesting point because we might be able to utilize it uh, to our benefit and to improve our model. For example, uh, will decide to send traffic to some cluster and actually trigger a scale event uh, and to pay more for the for the scale event and the resources uh, it requires to 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 get better performance for example and we'd like to to look in uh, to look into it in the future um another point is the multi hop or the or the service chain so if you remember um from previous slides, one of the, the techniques we 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 used uh, that was proposed for loan balancing is, is a chain oriented technique. And if we look at the application graph, we, we can see that the different chains of, of requests that are formed. Uh, and these techniques uh, that they are they require a lot of a lot of information. They require to know the application graph. Uh, but they do show some promising results in, in improving the, the overall turnaround time for, for a request to return to the user. Uh, two more points is the real-life testbed. We are working on implementing our solution within Submariner, and we hope to start testing it soon uh, in real-life scenarios on, with Submariner, not just simulating. Uh, and lastly, I have this, the, the link for the simulator I wrote here. I, I encourage everyone to, every one of you that, that want to explore and to see if we can improve uh, uh, the way it deploys uh, Submariner today, uh, to run this simulator, run its own, uh, your own uh, setup. I, I, we would also like you to send up your own, uh, if you can send us an example of the setups that you've been uh, using. Um, of the applications that you deploy so we can run it in the simulators. There is an explanation, there is a YAML file that you can configure and, and, and just run the simulations. Um, and that's it more or less. I wanted to thank you very much. There is, uh, here there is my email. Feel free to send me uh, questions or requests or, or everything that you want. If you have a problem with the simulator and you need help, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, and I wanted to know if you have uh, any more questions for me. Well, I have a few questions, but let's first take a look at the audience question. So uh, one question we have from or is what will the weight on each node? Like when we're talking about weight, right? So what would be the weight on each node? The weight on each node? Yeah, that's what the, so, I think. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I, I'll explain. So basically, we are uh, we are not looking at at the, at the system in, uh, from the node perspective. We are looking at more from the, from the service perspective. So we are not going to set the weights within nodes. Uh, Kubernetes um, has its own load balancing um, uh, between the different pods. So right in Kubernetes, we have the nodes, the different nodes, which are the, the virtual machines that supplies the compute power. And, and over them, we deploy the, the pods, the services, the the other components that we want to deploy in Kubernetes, and 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 the weight is going to be distributed between the, the different services, and, and each service has its own load balancing. I think it's around Robin uh, in Kubernetes, and, and it distributes the load between the different pods. So the weight is going to be on on services and not and not on nodes, if I understand the question correctly. I hope that, and just to clarify, in case you want to factor in. Um, weight on the nodes like node utilization or service utilization or port utilization as a factor you can always program that also into your cost function right that yeah, could be possible yeah, yeah. if someone wants to do that 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's right. So um, the if if we want to improve CP, like you said, CPU utilization and stuff like that, so we can introduce it into the process function. And, but it's important to remember that we have uh, the the constraints. So right. basically, um, it, a, anyway, I would look on CPU utilization as some kind of constraint that I would. I, I also know that it's being used for for uh, it's being vastly used for for scaling uh, purposes. So I would say that uh, I I don't want the, the system to suppress uh, this this amount of cpu utilization and then i would use it as the capacity constraint in, in, in the, right. the model uh, yeah but it will allow us this flexibility that's a good point right now just to clarify as general mentioned earlier right any parameter that can be represented in numbers can be fed into the system so yeah exactly so we we do not offer the measuring of the different metrics and parameters we exactly. will yeah we will offer the measuring of, of the latency and the pricing it's it's really easy to that to do but whoever would like to to extend and to take other metrics into account it, it what all it, all the this person will need to do is to measure them to, to find a way to measure them and just to quantify them and put them into, into the cost function exactly right. um, okay that's the only question asked from the audience i guess um, but i have uh, one more question yeah um, the second vishal or is also yeah. asked in the chat Right, so that's the question we just answered. The question yes. that or us is the one we just answered. Okay. okay. How do you define the, uh, a weight on a node? For example, on the navigation, a weight could uh, be the length of, uh, on a route. So, uh, can you say again? Um, or the, and ask, by the way, or you can uh, feel free to. Uh, Join the call yeah. as well. Uh, or ask, uh, uh, I mean, how do you define the weight on the node? For example, uh, on navigation, uh, disciplinary. Uh, OK, I, I, I think I understand it. When when he speaks about nodes, I, I guess he speaks about nodes uh, in the graph that we showed, uh, right? We, 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 are, we have some kind of a, of a acyclic graph a directed acyclic graph and and i guess it speaks about about the nodes in in this graph am, am i correct or i just don't see the chat uh, or you can uh, unmute and talk Yeah. I'll, I'll try to answer. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, yeah, we can so. hear you. Hey. hey. So I, my question is regarding the optimization problem that you described. Yeah. Uh, how do you define a weight on the on the node in order to solve the optimization problem? Um, so so that's what I'm trying to understand. When you talk about nodes, you talk about nodes on, on the graph that we described. Nodes on the cluster. No, so yeah, so so what I said, nodes in the cluster. When you're talking about the Kubernetes node, we are, we are talking about the, the the virtual machines, right? Yes. Yes. So we we are not uh, we are not defining weights on these nodes. We we are, what we are going to do, if you remember, I showed the, I showed the the lighthouse plugin in, in the Submariner, which is the DNS service discovery. And we are going to use the, the Kubernetes multi-cluster API to distribute the weights. We are, we are not going to, to define weights on the nodes. Um, we are going to define weights on the services, on the exported services in the, in the multi-cluster uh, environment. And basically, wh whenever a request uh, will be, whenever we query a DNS request to the Lighthouse plugin, it, it will have the, the lists of the of the different services that can answer to this to this uh, request, right? We will tell you. Listen, you asked for the detail service. It is this is the IP of the detail service in in the in, in cluster number one. This is the IP of the detail service in cluster number two. And 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 we will calculate the weights, right? We solve the optimization problem. We in, in, in the, Broker, we have all the parameters, everything. We solve the optimization problem. We calculated the weights from, from this solution, 
and then the lighthouse plugin will have this list. It will have the IP of, of details in cluster one, the IP of the detail service in cluster two, and it will have a weight, all right? It will, let's say we distribute the weight, uh, we decide to send 70% of the traffic to cluster number for the detail service in cluster one and 30% of the traffic to the detail service in, in, in cluster number two. And it will just apply a, a weighted round robin bouncing. And, and from there, it, the, the, once the, the IP is decided, the, the traffic is being direct, the, the communication is done directly uh, with the underlying VPN uh, networking that, that Submariner supplies. Um, w w after it, it will reach the service in the other cluster, right? It, we will reach the service, uh, the, the, the service IP in the other cluster. It, 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 sometimes it, it, you can look at it as a, as a flat IP network. Then, then Kubernetes networking, internal networking takes it from there. Um, so we basically, we do not set wet, weights on the nodes. We, we set the weights and we use the DNS service discovery mechanism we, we kind of uh, exploit it to our benefit. And, and, and this is how we're going to, to distribute the weights. We do not uh, uh, handle the nodes in, in any kind of case. Uh, does it answer your question? Thank you. Oh, all right. Perfect. Thanks, so. I had another question, but I think we are running out of time. We have Shay's presentation coming up next. So, yeah. uh, thanks, Daniel, and it's all okay. for the questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, so, Daniel covered the course performance optimization problem in a network connection that spans clusters across the globe. But you know, no matter how big or an abstract a network is at the underlying, at the end of it, the network devices will always be the building block of a network. So for the next talk, we are going to zoom in from a global scope into a, you know, right inside a data center, look at an individual switch in a data center and look at the same problem of cost performance optimization, but at a different scope. So now we'll have Shir introduce herself and tell us a bit more what she's going to talk about. Shir. Great, thanks Vishal. Thanks for having me today. Um, do you see my screen? Awesome. Okay, so uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about some of the challenges of network monitoring and telemetry and how we can use emerging technologies such as programmable switches to overcome them. So the internet has been around for say about 50 years uh, but unfortunately, we still see major disruption to service and even very long outages. And if we look at some of the causes of, of these big outages uh, and big companies that we've recently seen, uh, there, are, there are a number of reasons uh, for these disruptions. So the first and uh, maybe the most obvious reason is attacks. So things like distributed denial of service and BGP hijacking and so forth. But actually, there are many other reasons uh, for uh, problems that can occur and outages that can occur in the network. Uh, things like configuration errors, deployment bugs, and even bugs in routine maintenance processes uh, that can cause congestion and even cause outages. So these problems are actually pretty common. And uh, I myself have seen some of them uh, in, in our campus network. And the person who's in charge of keeping these networks up and running is the network administrator. And one of her main challenges uh, remains dealing with these everyday uh, network problems. So she's gonna be the star of our talk today. Um, and let's learn a little, bit, a little bit about her. So um, in order to handle these problems, she first needs to detect where and when a problem occurs. So if we're looking at a standard campus or company network, we can see that we have a switch at the entrance of the network and inside the network we have two regional switches say for building one and building two and they're connected to many users the ingress switch receives packets coming in or going out of the network processes them and sends them on to the next hop uh, according to, to the destination so so far so good but at some point some of, my, of the network users can start to experience uh, some delays or they, maybe they can't even access the internet at all. 
And in this case, the, the admin now has to figure out what's causing this. So maybe there's a DDoS attack on the network. Maybe there's a bunch of students trying to watch cat videos or, or the Super Bowl is currently on. Uh, maybe one of the um, IT folks is run, running some maintenance process uh, that's causing buildup on certain ports. Um, and, and she needs tools uh, to analyze the situation in the network. Tools like uh, that can monitor the network and collect the relevant measurements uh, so that she can start to figure out what actually happened. So when we say we want to analyze the traffic, we're actually talking about a lot of traffic. And just to give you some grasp of the numbers, a common 100 gigabit per second link can carry tens of millions of packets per second. That's about a packet coming in every few nanoseconds. And each of these packets is actually part of what we, what we call a flow. So a flow is a sequence of packets that share some common characteristic. Uh, for instance, the traffic between a source and destination in a TCP session, for example, is a flow. Uh, in the slide, we see that there are four flows. Uh, each, each flow is a different color, and each packet um, is, is characterized as being a part of one of these flows. So the same link that carries tens of millions of packets per second is carrying millions of flows per second. And this actually matters to us because we're going to be measuring both packets and flows, as we will see in a bit. So now that we know how much traffic uh, we need to process, uh, we need to see where uh, and, and, and how we can actually process this traffic. So the first method is the traditional method uh, that is actually still used in many networks today and is particularly in, in data centers. So each switch in the, uh, in the network can collect a sample of traffic that is uh, sent off to a collector uh, for analysis. So as we can see, the, the, the traffic is sent uh, off path. And this therefore incurs some communication uh, and computation overhead. And what this, uh, the result of this is basically that the rate at which we can sample is relatively low. So we're talking about orders of one over 10,000 packets. Data centers today uh, sample at a rate of, of say one over 30,000. Uh, so while this could be sufficient for handling like large anomalies, if there's a very good problem that we can see with these samples, a lot of problems can still go undetected. If we have to process all the traffic uh, for things, say, like intrusion detection, then we can use something called software middle boxes. And these are servers that are put on path in the network, and they could potentially process all the traffic. Uh, but this is software. It has limited throughput. And therefore, if we do process all the traffic, all, all the traffic through it, it is very likely to cause uh, bottlenecks. Another option is to use uh, the built-in monitoring options of existing switches, for example, uh, things like NetFlow. Um, and this is so. This is in the network. It's on path. It's happening inside the switch, and therefore, um, this can process all of the traffic. But the analysis uh, that the, the, this switch can provide in this case is very limited and coarse-grained and very rigid. Uh, so it's not going to be enough for us for a lot of the things that we want to be able to, to monitor. So actually, none of these methods really hit the mark because we want analysis that, uh, that is, on the one hand, scalable uh, so that it can handle all the traffic efficiently. Uh, but we also want it to be accurate so that we can catch the bad, the bad guys without hurting the good guys. And this actually gives us a certain trade-off between how precise our analysis can be and the amount of, of traffic that we can actually process. Uh, luckily for us, uh, in recent years, we've seen a new paradigm in networking called software-defined networks, or SDN, and maybe some of you have heard of it. Um, so SDN provides a new division of labor between the data plane and the control plane. And with it is brought a development of new programmable devices uh, for the network and that are inside the network. So um, 
with, with the programmable devices or programmable switch in our case, we can actually perform uh, analysis uh, that we define right in the data plane. Uh, so, that, so it will run at line rate uh, and it can therefore process all the traffic. But because we need to, line, to run at line rate, uh, this will uh, the analysis that this can uh, perform will be limited. Uh, but as I will show you today, uh, we can still do some pretty cool things within these limitations. So just a small summary of what we've seen so far. Uh, we've seen that analysis can be done on software where we can perform any computation but with limited throughput, or we can do it on hardware where we can process all the traffic um, at line rate. And with legacy switches, the available computation was very limited. Whereas with programmable switches, we uh, see new capabilities uh, in packet processing. So let's look a little bit about what these switches actually look like. So a common standard in programmable switches is called PISA, or Protocol Independent Switch Architecture. And we can see here that the general architecture contains three components. Each packet going in will be parsed using a programmable uh, user-defined parser. So it's the user can actually define the way in which the packet will be parsed. It will get then go through a processing pipeline, and then it will be reassembled and sent along on its way. Now, we will mostly be focusing on the processing pipeline. And this pipeline is composed of a series of stages, as we can see here in the picture. Each stage contains a match action unit that can actually run match action rules and a very small amount of memory. So in order to run in line rate, these resources are very constrained. So the number of stages that we actually have is very small. We're talking about like orders of tens, small tens uh, of, packet, of, of stages, sorry. Um, we also have a limited number of actions that we can perform both uh, on the packet and in the memory of the stage. And also the available memory is very limited. But actually the memory model here is also very interesting and will actually have significant impact on the processing that we can do. So besides being limited in size, it's actually also partitioned. So each stage has its own uh, dedicated memory and it can only access this memory and no other stage can access uh, that stage's memory. Uh, Additionally, the pipeline is uh, feed forward. So once we leave a stage, we cannot access the memory of that stage anymore in, in the processing of that packet. And finally, the number of registers that we can access in each stage is very, very small. And we're talking about like a really a tiny constant because we, we want to be able to run at line rate. So we can't access a whole lot of memory uh, and, and keep this uh, keep the throughput. Uh. Okay, sure. so this looks interesting, but still feels very restrictive, right? Like, what are the possibilities that we can do with this? You know, especially like coming from a talk by Daniel, where anything that you can think of, you can add in. So, but this looks like it's very restrictive. What can be done with this and how it can be held? How can it help with the problem that we were just discussing? Like, is it? So thanks, Vishal. That's a great question. And this is actually what we're going to be talking about uh, next. So we've actually seen, and this is there's been a lot of work done on this in recent years, uh, especially on things like monitoring telemetry and security uh, and things that we can now do in the switches that we couldn't do uh, in the past. Um, I myself have worked on a number of problems in this area from detection and analysis of congestion and packet drops to distributed network-wide measurements and uh, security things like uh, protecting like the, the DNS service, uh, for example. Today, we're going to focus on uh, one of these uh, problems, and we're specifically going, going to be talking about a network queue diagnostics. Uh, that is actually really critical analysis that we can now perform in the switch, and we actually couldn't do earlier. So what do we mean by switch queue diagnostics? We saw a few slides ago the architecture of a single uh, pipeline. But switches usually actually have a number of pipelines uh, for both uh, uh, ingress and egress ports. 
So as the packets come in through one of these ingress ports, it is processed by uh, the pipeline handling that port. And there the switch decides which output, output port uh, the packet should be sent through. Uh, and once that decision is made, the packet is placed in the appropriate queue to be sent out of that chosen port. So that's the basic uh, flow of, of packets within the switch. But what happens if we have too many packets? So if, if we have a lot of packets coming in uh, for the same queue, uh, the queuing buffer will get full. And long buffers are a problem because they will cause delays. So for example, if you're streaming a soccer game, you might have some annoying lags. But now that it's full, if another packet comes in, it will actually no longer have room in the queue uh, to, to be placed in the queue. And therefore, it will unfortunately be dropped. And in this case, the damage is going to be even, even greater. One of the main reasons for these long queues is something we call microbursts. Microbursts are short-lived bursts of traffic that can cause, which are caused maybe by uh, incast or uh, certain types of DDoS attacks, for example. And these microbursts cause like almost immediate uh, uh, queuing and, and almost immediate packet loss. We can see in this graph that measures queue length over time that to the majority of the time, the queues are relatively level and small. And every once in a while, we have these little peaks. Uh, and, and these are ca caused by uh, microbursts. And these bursts are so short that we can actually only analyze them well within the data plane or within the switch themse switches themselves. But unfortunately, legacy switches or existing switches basically only provide very coarse-grained statistics um, about these queues. They're aggregated over minutes and at best seconds. So for example, we could have a switch provide the average queue length over a five-second interval, for example. And these averages over lengthy periods uh, might actually cause us to not even see the microburst within these figures. Uh, additionally, even the, the information that they do give is usually only about the queue length or things that are related to the queue. They don't really tell us what's going on inside the queue. Finally, this information is not processed inside the switch. It is actually sent offline, uh, sent to a controller or a collector for some offline analysis. So even if the analysis can detect that a burst has occurred, it is long gone, and the damage is already, uh, has already been done. And what we can see from this graph that we saw earlier is that if we have short buffers, say we max our buffers at 2x, uh, this would mean immediate packet loss uh, when we have these bursts. And therefore, what, what happens is that most vendors actually provide much longer buffers in order to uh, avoid these losses. And this is actually a real problem for network administrators because they are faced with the well-known trade-off between cost and performance. We see this, you know, when we go buy a laptop, uh, we, if we want more performance, we want to we want to buy more RAM, but this is expensive, so we start, you know, making making this trade-off ourselves. And well, buffers are also very expensive, and we want to keep them uh, short. We also don't want want to have long buffers that are, you know underutilized most of the time. On the other hand, we want to be able to support these bursty workloads. And we really don't want to be, be dropping packets because that's detection in the switch within the data plane. It's going to be fine grained because Conquest does a per packet analysis. And in fact, each packet going through the switch will check to see if it is part of the heavy flow in the queue. So we'll see how that helps us in a little bit. And what this means is that um, in, in data centers, for example, uh, that usually 
only a handful of flows are the ones uh, causing the burst. And we see here in this data center trace, against, again, we're looking at key utilization over time. At any given point, that those red lines uh, show the single top flow uh, for that time period. And the little green things at the bottom are all the other flows. And we can clearly see that this top flow usually prevails uh, when the switch gets long. So by rate limiting even that single heavy flow, we can actually reduce uh, the burst duration by orders of magnitude. So we want to measure the packets. Sorry, in the queue uh, at any given time. So when we want to do this, we can think about a straw man solution that, for example, maintains a table of the flow sizes in the queue. So when a packet arrives, we increment the counter. There we go. Uh, another, another packet arrives, we increment again. And finally, when a packet leaves, uh, the, reach the queue, we decrement the counter. However, we could have another packet coming in, uh, another packet coming into the queue. And in this case, we would actually have um, the possibility of concurrent access to this queue. And the, first of all, the, um, the switch has uh, partition memory. And the reason for this is because concurrent access can actually cause memory hazards. So we actually have to have this memory partition. So this solution will not be able to work because we don't have a place on the switch in which we can uh, place such a table. Um, so instead, Conquest is going to use something we call snapshots. Um, and, and this will be able to overcome this, this uh, partition memory problem. So we're going to split the traffic into time windows. And each window is going to be placed in a designated snapshot. And how does this help us? So let's look at an example. Suppose that uh, each snapshot records four packets. So as the packets come in, they, they will be placed in the appropriate snapshot. So now we're in snapshot one. And the packets come in, and they keep being placed in the snapshot. Once that snapshot gets filled up, we will move on uh, to the next snapshot and we continue doing this as the packets go through. Now packet E comes in and packet E actually waited a long time in the queue. Specifically, E entered um, at T equals 5 and, and left the queue at T equals 14. And E wants to know why, uh, who actually caused it to wait. And, and if there's something that, that uh, this packet can do in order to, uh, to help the next packets uh, along. So we actually know why E waited, right? We know how long he was in the queue. So E waited because of these packets that were in the queue ahead of it. And we can count them um, exactly. We, so we can't count them exactly, sorry, because uh, of, of, uh, of the partition memory. But using the snapshots that are contained within this range, we can actually get a pretty good approximation of these counts. So we're going to be using the snapshots with, that are completely within that range and, and using the information there in order to uh, um, infer the counts of the flows in the queue. So these snapshots do come at the expense of accuracy. But we're going to show that the error is not going to be too big. So the snapshots will, will cover uh, the entire queue. Uh, so the more snapshots, the less packets that we placed in each, and uh, therefore we get less error. So when I mean what I mean by this is that basically if, we're, if, if we have four snapshots, so each snapshot is going to maintain a fourth of the queue. Um, so we potentially have some error maybe in the first and last snapshots. Uh, but when the, queue, when the queue is long, these snapshots uh, will only contain a small number of packets from the entire queue. So the, the relative contribution is not going to be too big. One more thing is that even, using, even if we're using snapshots, we actually don't have enough memory to keep an exact counter of each flow in each snapshot. But that's OK, because remember, we only care about the heavy flows that are the ones causing the buildup. 
So instead of using exact counters and keeping state for flow, we're going to be using something called sketches. These are sublinear data structures that can approximate the count of the heavy flows. And these sketches do have some error. They could have some overestimation, uh, but it will not be significant uh, for these heavy flows. So we implemented Conquest uh, on a real hardware switch, and we did a bunch of, of tests, and we found that Conquest is relatively accurate and can give us uh, over 90% precision and recall. We also showed a nice proof of concept about of how Conquest can help keep these queues short. So a very basic approach for dealing with congestion is by setting um, the ECN bit or the explicit congestion notification bit to, to in, which kickstarts uh, congestion control. So normally what happens is when congestion occurs, all the flows are marked with, uh, with this ECN bit in order to uh, um, relieve the congestion. Instead, we suggest uh, marking only the heavy flows that Conquest uh, detected. And as we can see in this graph, again, we're looking at queue size over time. The red lines are the basic ECN when we mark all the packets uh, when there's congestion. And the blue line is our flow-based ECN marking, which only marks um, the, um, the heavy flows. And as we can see, using this flow-based uh, ECN marking, we can actually lower the uh, queue length significantly. So in summary, uh, we have presented um, we have we've discussed programmable networks and we've shown how we can use them uh, to do real-time fine-grained telemetry. Um, this enables us to, to take corrective action in the data plane and it really gives us new opportunities for network management. We've talked about Conquest, which is just one example of, of what we can do with these switches, uh, which is uh, basically a, a system of compact data structures that uh, approximates Q content and is able to find heavy flows at a sub millisecond level. Finally, we, we really think that these programmable networks can be a real game changer in the way that we run our networks. In the long run, uh, we hope to see something we call self-managing networks, which is um, basically the switch itself can take these measurements and can take action according to these measurements, um, hopefully uh, uh, creating the, an automatic processing of network management and really simplifying uh, network manage management processes uh, altogether. So I thank you. Sure, uh, question on this one. So self-managing network and looking at this, it looks like more like a long-term plan, right? So, but what are the mm -hmm. immediate next-term Goals that you have in immediate next term steps. Um, yeah, so I think th so. There's a lot of things happening right now. First of all, there's we're, we're really seeing some cool things in security and new things that you can do within the network, and that, that's really awesome. I think that in order to make this um, more deployable and more usable, I think that uh, programming programming the switch needs to be uh, made. Uh, made simpler and there's actually a lot of groups that are working on this right now in terms of of, of, of making the switch uh, easier to, to be programmed. Additionally, as we saw, the resources are very constrained. And I think that one of the things that um, we are still struggling with, and, and I think we're going to have to answer this uh, pretty soon, is how we can allocate these resources. Um, because we basically can't, you know, it depends, you know, depending on, on uh, what the switch needs, the tasks that the switch needs to perform and so on, we need to somehow decide, you know, who gets what. Um, and right. I think that this is a significant problem that we're going to have to address uh, pretty soon. Okay. Yeah, so that looks like some fun field to work in. So we, in audience, we have a question from Kobe. What is your suggestion about networking use? PISA type hardware or move to a SDN type solution? Um, for general, like in general for networking? 
Um, so PISA is an SDN uh, type solution. I'm not sure I understand um, the question completely. All right. Uh, Kobe, maybe you want to clarify what, what you mean, like, yes, PISA does not rule out SDN. You can have PISA work in sync with the SGN, right? So mm -hmm. Yeah. The main difference between SGN and PISA is uh, what are the on switches, where is your control panel, where are the calculations being done? So you can offload some of them to SGN if you want. Uh, so maybe you can clarify the question a bit more. Well, you can assume what you mean is like a, a PISA a solution without SDN and, and say with SDN. Maybe let's go with that. Maybe um, so, so, switch so, with SDN versus PISA without SDN. Maybe like we can compare those two. So PISA is part of SDN. So we right. you can't have um, programmable devices without, without SDN. Yeah. yeah. So so right. it's kind of I think they, they go hand in hand. Maybe over when they say SGN, they mean a uh, specific SGN controller or something, I guess. I'm not sure. What, what Sorry, I didn't, understand. I didn't catch that. I I think that maybe when they say SGN, they mean a SGN controller that sits on top of a that a PISA switch is. I see. Common. Yeah. So, so there is. So the, the PISA architecture, architecture, sorry, the PISA switch does, does have a controller. This is right. not what I was talking about was mostly the data plane, but there is, there right. is of course, a controller. And, and, and yeah, this Right, the control pin will still have a SGN controller working with it, yeah. right? Uh, okay, um, I had a couple of more questions. So one was, what is the current state of the solution? Because it looks very interesting, very promising. What is it? Is it available as a product or prototype? Yeah, so actually, um, I think most major vendors actually have programmable devices now. We're talking about Broadcom, Mellanox. Um, there is a company uh, that was called Barefoot that was acquired by Intel um, a few months ago. Um, that they were the ones that basically were the first to create these piece of type uh, switches. So now they're owned by Intel. Um, and I think this is something that they are really uh, pushing forward also. I mean, by talking with, with these uh, with some of these companies, uh, this is something that, that is really being pushed forward. And also we have like big companies like Google and Alibaba and others that have actually started deploying um, these software defined networks, not necessarily PISA just yet, because this is, so PISA switches are something that was developed in the past, I don't know, maybe three or four years ago. Uh, so this is really new. Uh, before that we had, so SDN has been around since around 2008. And before that we had switches that were much, that, that were programmable, but a lot more limited. And then in the programmability that you could do things like OpenFlow, for example. Um, so those are already in use. Um, and I think that there's a lot of, a, a lot of questions that we're getting from different places in the industry about where they can use uh, programmable switches, and, and we see this both in, in, in the research that these companies produce and, and, and talking with them. Uh, maybe let me rephrase the question a bit differently. Uh, what is the state of Conquest? Like, is Conquest available as a solution on some of the products, or is it? I, I see. So, actually, so, so this is actually a, a cool question. Uh, Conquest was what we, we implemented uh, Conquest on a um, on a piece of switch and we deployed it um i was before joining the open university i was at princeton and we actually deployed this at the princeton campus and we were able to see some uh really interesting uh problems in the network using conquest um also we were conquest was done in collaboration with at&t and at&t had also uh, uh deployed conquest in one of their test beds um, and that was really awesome too, because we really could see things that they just couldn't see before. Um, and, and they were both on campus and, uh, and in at and they were having, we saw problems that nobody knew why they were happening. And, and then getting this information from Conquest, things became a lot clearer. So it's not, I mean, we have the code on GitHub if anybody wants to, to use it, it's, it's out there. Um, but it's not a product just yet. <laughs> so I think that kind of answers my question. So it's available on GitHub. Oh. That's the answer. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, other question? I, I, I will say uh, most, yeah. a lot of the projects. So part of the um, motivation for having these programmable networks is actually to, to you know, have, be more open source and have right. more people be involved. Exactly. So right. a lot of the pro a lot of the projects um, that we've seen are available on GitHub. So it's it's definitely there. Okay, uh, I think this question that was one of the first question I had when I started working with um, programmers, which is an SDN. I'm sure many in the audience would also be having. So the solution you mentioned says programmable switches, but I would say even today, the majority of the devices out there on networks and in data centers are legacy devices, which are not programmable switches. Mm -hmm. So, so my question would be, would it be possible to make Conquest and, and such a solution work with legacy devices? Yes, no, if yes, how? So uh, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, okay. What we, so we, we actually got a similar question from AT&T because again, you know, their switches are not uh, programmable just yet. Um, and and but they 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 did have these problems in legacy switches and they just didn't know what was going on. So what we actually did was we set up a a mechanism that um, pairs a programmable switch with a legacy switch, and basically for uh, packets coming in through the legacy switch, we clone them and place them and 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 sent them over to the programmable switch where we marked um, the time that they entered the switch. And then we again tap them at the egress of the legacy switch. So we, 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 we got the packets both when they were coming in and as they were going out. And when they were going out, again, they went through the programmable switch and we marked that time. So at that point, the programmable switch knew how the time at which the uh, packet entered the switch and the time at which the packet left the switch. And Using that information, we could get like very similar statistics um, to, uh, to to what we got in Conquest. Um, now, this was, I mean, I'm not going to get into the you know the fact that we have multiple pipelines and we can't tap everything, and there are some issues there. It's not you know that straightforward, but it was really cool. We've actually patent this. We have a patent on this that was just registered a few days ago, so this is pretty awesome. Michelle, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, so we have another question in chat from me. Uh, can the memory in PISA registers be read online from an outside device for, say, DPI or ML tasks? That is, the logic is not done on the switch itself. Um, right. So, yes, the controller can read the memory, but the, but the uh, rates at which it can read the memory is much um, much slower than we can do um, within the data plane. Um, there have been works, for example, that do string matching on, on, the piece, on a piece of switch uh, for the question of, of, of deep packet inspection, for example. But I don't think we're going to be doing deep packet inspection on, on these switches uh, just yet. We might be able to do some parts um, uh, you know, if we identify that there are parts that are uh, better to do on the switch, then we can probably do them. Um, but in order, I mean, in order to run at line rate, you're not going to be able to even process the entire packet um, within these throughputs. So, so it's it's you can use it, but I think that we're not we're not there just yet. There's also a bunch of works being done on how you can do machine learning and even by aggregating information, you generally can send reports or information from the uh, the data plane to the control plane. So you can have that uh, information flow also. Um, and you can also read the information on the switch. But again, this these are uh, both uh, um, with much lower rates, yeah. Right. It, it would impact the line rate, right? You won't be able to get line rate if you yep. try to do it once. Yeah, even, even to do string matching um, in right. the switch for an entire packet, you had to, there's a, we didn't talk about this, but basically you could recirculate the packet uh, through the switch, and in order to even parse the entire packet, you're going to have to recirculate a bunch of times. Right. So we can't do that for all the packets. Okay. Those are the questions for this. Uh, thanks a lot, Shay. Uh, and I think we had 
Michel, I see that Kobe yeah. clarified in the chat what he meant. Okay. Okay, what is your suggestion about networking? Use PISA type hardware or move transient type solution in the aspect of should invest in better switches or we can start moving to work with software resident solution and are we getting the same results in performance and monitoring accuracy? Um, so I'll try to answer that. So if the results that we're getting in, so I'm, hold on, I'm going to read this for a second. Um, so I think that there are products out there already, and, and I think we can work with them. Obviously, they're going to improve uh, over time. We've already seen, for example, Barefoot um, just put out a new version of their switch, which is uh, bigger and stronger, you know. <laughs> uh, so it, it gives us more, uh, more possibilities. That doesn't mean we can't start moving forward, but I think that there, we'll, we're going to be seeing major developments probably in, in the next few years. Um, in terms of performance, um, we're seeing these switches go at, you know, several terabits per second, uh, which is uh, uh, pretty fast. Um, and in terms of monitoring, we, we, we get, you know, much better, uh, much better results using programmable switches just because you can do whatever you want. With the legacy switches, if you wanted for example, if you had a you know an, uh, a, right, uh, a standard switch uh, that Cisco built, for example, then if you wanted to have something be done on that switch that wasn't there, you have to go ask Cisco, you know, get into their uh, line, uh, get get it, get it be a feature that somebody will develop, and eventually you might get it back. But now you could actually do this all uh, on your own. Um, so so I think that you can get something that is much more. Um, tailored to your needs. Uh, um, and therefore, you could basically the monitoring that you can do is, is really dependent on what you need. Just to add a bit to this, I would say that it boils down to what is the that you are trying to solve, right? Because when you have SGN and you're ascending data traffic to it to do any decision making for the control plane, there will always be a performance impact on your line rate, right? So if the sort of problem you're trying to solve is mainly about analysis of traffic and then and you a bit more of a long-term feedback loop from the control train yeah as would help you with it but if like the problem that she was discussing in her presentation which is more in a data plane and needs to be this quickly enough the mm -hmm. engine controller would end up being a bottleneck and you will lose that line rate performance if it's okay to lose it then yes maybe you could again as i said it become depends on the problem you're trying to solve you know so I hope that answer your question, Kobe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Daniel, are you there? I think we had a question earlier from Irina. Maybe you can answer it now. Uh, the question was I know we discussed it in chat, but just for the sake of recording, let's just voice it out. So the question was Does the solution work with service mesh? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it, it, it's a really good question. You and you helped me up with the answering it. Um, and, and like you said, in short, we uh, Submariner does not uh, support really support the uh, service mesh at, at the moment, and we are kind of uh, an, an alternative for connecting uh, the clusters uh, using Submariner, right? If if you're using a service mesh like Istio or Winter, uh, you will probably use one of uh, their solutions for connecting clusters, and 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 it's. Taking me back to to uh, the slide in the in the presentation where where we showed the the different uh, the different possible solution for load balancing and one one of them was client based load balancing, which this is this is the kind of uh, of technique that is being adopted by by service mesh, and so so like you you answered we we, we do not supply uh, we do not support service mesh and we kind of uh, compete with it. Um, but we do plan in the future uh, to see how we can integrate uh, with, with different service mesh solutions. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I hope it answers. And just to add something that Nir also clarified in, in chat, uh, you know, in Submariner we do not impact how the traffic is handled between each cluster, and optimization is more about how to decide from which cluster do you want to go to. It's more of a routing or a scheduling decision, and. Yeah. 
since Samarina provides east-west communication between the clusters, you can use it in conjunction with Istio if you want, right? And I, you mentioned that they are working on a QCon submission on this very same topic, how you can use Submariner with Istio. Maybe you may want to attend that one too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a good point. Where, uh, a Submariner, like like you mentioned, it, it's kind of a, um, the, the layer three networking that works between the cluster. When right. traffic arrives within the cluster, we, we do not interfere with it. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Thanks, you. Uh, those are two very interesting topics. I think Eden has something to say. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to uh, thank our presenters today. Thank you very, very much. Uh, it's challenging to do this uh, virtually uh, and in a form platform. So thank you very much for taking the time and investing. And uh, also thank you for all our guests who joined us today to listen. Uh, please feel free to contact us. Uh, we promote those kinds of collaboration. If you see something that is of an interest to you, we would love to uh, have uh, our engineers to take part in. And we would also love to create more relationship to produce more Daniels and uh, more relationship, create relationships uh, such with Shear. So uh, thank you very much for joining us and we'll be happy to see you next time. Goodbye. Thanks everyone. Have a nice day. Bye.